you want to trivialize anti-Semitism by applying the term to these kinds of things. You've cheapened it. You've trivialized it. You have made it an entirely meaningless and contemptible term, the main victims of which are going to be Jews who experience genuine anti-Semitism. Something I have been arguing about arguing about for a very long time. So there's going to be a I'm very terrified of the possibility of a reaction uh, internationally if a lot of these lies end up becoming uh, more instantiated in the minds of people throughout the world. And, that it will whole... be unfair, and it will be unfair to innocent Jews around the world who get the have to deal with the repercussions for that yeah. possibly happening. And and he did that to Miko Paled too, kind of like uh, you know, jumps in, he has all these out of context, middle of the story type of facts, and it's like, but don't go back before this because then you'd see other things. And it's like, come on. Yeah, I mean, it's... that dude committed so many fallacies that enshrined in their law that took two quote KU two complex question about the kick us out or them out. And that's also a false dichotomy. But then he also did this thing at the end there that really pissed me off. He did this straw man into an ad hominem, which is like, well, what are you going to do? So you're saying it's illegal under international law about these settlements. Now we're just going to have a bunch of Israeli refugees. Oh, you're just going to kick them all out. So he built a straw man based on that and then leads over to that's anti-Semitic. I mean, just uh, it's just uh, it's frustrating, man, seeing and like the, the the individual on the right, just you can clearly he, he's Joseph in over Cohen. His head. You should know him. He's, he's out there debating all the people that are trying to like talk some people. sense into into the world. That and, debate, uh, but they don't know like the basic rules of debate. They don't understand fallacies. They don't understand argumentation. They don't understand appeals to evidence and proper sort of uh, syllogistic logic. I mean, Jesus, is, excuse my language, but fuck, this is fucked up. Yes, uh, there it is. And uh, it's only going to get more. I mean, the next block that we have to cover posits the idea. This is not my idea. This is the idea that is posited by the clips. Uh, you're going to hear a clip from Chris Hedges, and then you're going to hear uh, a lecture from the Center for Jewish Studies, Jewish History. Um, and it's going to show you evidence that anti-Semitism is a stimulus needed for the defense system that is Zionism, and it's a symbiosis, uh, kind of like, uh, I, I don't want to say parasite and host type relationship, but I'll leave it to you to see what kind of symbiosis is drawn between the two dynamics that are kind of, you've already heard it tonight from Zach Foster, inseparable. So these two things come together, and the overuse of the legitimate term uh, you know, for people who are doing hatred like that, that takes away the scrutiny that should be brought in those situations where people are being hateful, because when anytime you can't cite some facts, you just go to this trope of saying, uh, calling people names uh, without uh, really attaching uh, any meaning or substance or evidence to the issue being talked about. It's only it's like a not Jedi mind trick. It only works on the weak minded people and they gaslight mm -hmm. their own audience, which is not a good way to keep going through life. So we're going to go into this next clip. They got away just... with the currency of anti-Semitism as a form of weaponized empathy. It's really a form of victimhood currency. You can think of it as literally a currency for a very long time. And it garnered incredible power, um, gained access to incredible technologies, um, you know, and uh, helped facilitate the Ayn Rand Contra Fair <laughs> alongside the U.S. and a whole host of other uh, bad actors. Um, yeah, I mean, Israel, I don't know what more can be said at this point. Uh, they're about as guilty as one. And unfortunately, I, actually, that the other individual on the left-hand side of that video did a brilliant job of pointing out the trivialization of the term uh, anti-Semitic because it's being utilized too openly to as a form of either intense justification for their actions or quick ad hominem utilized obviously in oftentimes both contexts at the same time. And that's becoming something that's, I think, uh, a little overdone. See, before in the past, it's nebulous. It uh, wasn't well-defined, a lot of the scenarios, but now this is pretty well-defined. We can see pretty objectively in real time what is going on. And uh, they can't get away by just hiding behind Hospera only and 
limited information about what's going on in Gaza or the West Bank, which had been the issue for, you know, decades. So with the current technological situation, the IDF and the sort of uh, instantiation of this mind virus of Zionism within them, they're actually showcasing their work, war crimes real time and being so unbelievably conspicuous that it's going to have, it's seemingly starting to have a backlash effect, hopefully, especially in regards to how much people are taking that term anti-Semitism seriously. So, Well, we are about to dig into the mindset behind the natural born settlers mentality. And we're going to go to a quick clip from Chris Hedges that then ties into the lecture, uh, all Jewish history in less than one hour. And uh, we are not even going to take in like you know, maybe one third of that because it's a couple of 10 minute chunks, but it takes a beginning part about the religious beliefs and it ties it in with the political and then the ethno racial kind of eugenics aspect of it that has taken hold in modern day Zionism. And you're going to see how they work together. So let's go to these uh, these two clips and then we will help you tie it together afterwards on the other side obvious place, although it contains certain very, very deep problems that we're still facing in 2024, which is what do you do with the fact that there's other people living there. But in any event, I think that that the Zionism as a solution to a European Jewish problem, and it really was a European Jewish problem, is, um, is in a certain sense made more powerful by the collapse of Europe by the 1880s, 1890s, certainly by the 1930s, where it just simply became impossible or, or extremely dangerous for Jews to continue to live in Europe. So Zionism became the alternative, and there were many other alternatives at the time that was the most uh, reasonable.